I hate these silly tra slide transitions. That was a mistake. I would never include such things in my slides. Choice, right. OK, finally, sorry. Databases. So hopefully this will only take 15, 20 minutes, if that. Um, so we talked about, I talked about data, information, and knowledge a little bit this morning. So, and then sort of worked my way towards sort of general role of uh, information technology in enabling us to extract, basically manage our data and extract information out of data and then manage information and knowledge, whatever those quite are. So what is a database? Well, I'm sure you probably know. But it's basically an integrated, defined as an integrated set of data of a particular subject. And it's usually held digitally nowadays. But there are still many, many paper-based record systems in existence, surprisingly many. Uh, not so much, perhaps, in the UK, but certainly uh, you go into smaller organisations, chari smaller charities and things like that, you'll find a lot more paper-based systems still in existence. You go elsewhere in the world where IT is not quite so integrated into uh, life, you'll find more paper-based systems. And paper-based systems have a lot going for them, let's be honest, they're cheap, they're simple, uh, and that's one of their great things. So a database doesn't have to be in a computer, but we are talking about databases in computers, not surprisingly. And unsurprisingly, they support various query languages. So the data within, data within a database uh, is structured following some kind of database model, data, some kind of database data model. And I'll, we'll see what those are in a minute. It's a basically the structure, how the database, how data is structured within the database. And there are alternative ways of structuring data within different databases. Um, a good, most databases, or data within databases, should be described by what we call metadata. Metadata is, to use its sort of standard definition, data about data. So data, data, metadata explains what a data set is, where it's come from, who's it, who made it, when it was made, how it was made, what state, spatial and temporal coverage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's not only the data, but there's the data that describes the data, the metadata. And um, while many databases support metadata, um, it's not always implemented within, not every database has a full metadata, data, a set of metadata implemented on top of it. So a lot of databases lack meta, formally arranged metadata. And we'll have a whole lecture on metadata later in the, in the system. Conversely, so some systems have no metadata attached. Others have metadata attached to the underlying data. And then you get databases that are databases of metadata but don't contain the data. And we're going to discuss all these options in due course. So, uh, and um, you need some kind of interface onto the database. And your interface, you can have many different types of interface onto a database. So, uh, which will depend on, and the type of interface will depend on the, who the users are and what their user needs are. Uh, so, for a, what you might call a power user or a developer, might use a simple SQL. Stru SQL is structured query language, and we'll get onto structured query. That structured query language is the query language for querying and managing data within relational databases. So you might use direct query of the database using a SQL query string. However, that's not the preferred method of access for most people. Most people don't know how to write SQL, don't want to 
need to learn how to you write SQL have no need. So we provide other kinds of graphic, generally graphic interfaces onto that database. These can be simply form-based or, from our perspective, they incorporate maps. But also any other kind of visualization maps are just one type of visualization. You could also have uh, temple trends, you know, timelines, all sorts of other ways of displaying the information in a database. So basically a database integrated set of data on a particular subject, structured following some kind of database model, hopefully with a bit of metadata describing what the database actually contains, and then some kind of interface onto that database or multiple interfaces onto that database for different users with different needs. Any data can be stored in any database model, but some are more suitable than others, as the cartoon shows. It's easy to put a square peg in a round hole. All you have to do is cut every single corner and cram it in as hard as you can. So it is possible to build a mapping application using a network database. And I'll explain what a network database is, but it wouldn't be very sensible and it would take an awful lot of effort and it wouldn't be very efficient. So you choose your database model according to the structure of your data, generally. Now, when you're integrating data which has different sort of natural structures, then you may actually have to store that. In, you either have to have the choice of trying to put your square peg into a round hole and getting all your data in one database model or have two separate databases running different database models and then you bring the data together in some form or fashion afterwards. I'll talk about some in future lectures about my issues with connecting networks to spatial data and temporal time series and all this kind of thing where these come in. Okay, so it's possible to put any data in any database model, but it's not very simple. So in their beginning, there were flat files. Everyone Familiar with flat files, the idea, or data files? Okay, flat files are simply raw text files. Now, I never quite know how to say what, what is a raw text file. A text file is something, is a, is a file that contains text characters without any additional um, formatting or coding implemented on top of it, okay? So you open Notepad in uh, Windows, that is a basic text editor. You can't save any bold, you can't make it italic, you can't change the colour, you can't insert pictures, all it is is strings of text, uh, which may be encoded in one or more of the text encoding standards, but we won't worry about that. There are a number of those. So they might, they're not all exactly the same, but they're quite similar. And basically, it's a file that contains text without any additional formatting. So you never write, you never open Microsoft Word or LibreOffice Word processor and write, and write a text file in there. I mean, you can do it, but programs, word processor document, word processing documents are designed to include all the, high, the, the highlighting and the formatting and the arrangement. So therefore, they tend to add in all this extra information that is unnecessary. Better off, use a simple text editor. My favourite, the one I use all the time, is called Notepad++. Uh, it's like Notepad in Windows, except that it does really useful things like it does syntax highlighting of code. So if I've got a HTML file up there, and it knows it's an HTML file, it'll highlight the various bits in the HTML file, which makes it easy to use. We'll get onto that in due course. So a raw text file is basically a file that contains text and nothing else. And these have been used since the beginning of computing, but once we get, got rid of um, punch cards and things like that to store data as, as the sort of first way in which data was stored and is still used incredibly commonly throughout um, many, many computer systems. And indeed, a lot of um, Linux-based software and databases and things work solely on text files almost. 
So what, here's two examples of text files. This, anyone recognize that? The top one here. Anybody know what that is? A projection file, yeah. It, it's an Esri projection file. So when you get a shape file with a .prj extension, how many people, you, everyone familiar with shape files, yeah? Roughly. A shape, we'll meet them soon enough. A shape file is a, a simple way of store, a uh, 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 format for storing geographical data. Okay. You'll be meeting those kinds of things more in the other modules than in this one. Okay. So this is a PRJ file, and exactly it stores a projection. This is the WGS84 projection, which is used by GPS. And this is the, contains the information that ArcGIS or QGIS or any other spatial program would use to know what geographic projection the data that you've received in. In this case, it's for a, a shape file which has been downloaded from the uh, Natural Earth, which is an open global data set. It's the one that I use for most of my regional and global scale work, I'll, I'll often use the um, natural earth data sets, a sort of base data set here. Tells us what the datum is and everything. It's the information that the computer and the GIS needs to know how to project that data. So they can be, flat files can be any format you like. You can just write any text that they are. So that's an example of a projection file, Esri projection file format. Here's a simple example of how you store a table in a text file. In this case, it's a tab delineated file where you've got field names at the top, values in the first line is the name of the field name, subsequent, uh, subsequent rows contain the data, and each item, each column is separated in this case by a tab. Tab being this... Um, if you're not familiar with tabs, which I think you should be, is that this thing on the keyboard there. It's a set distance. But similarly, we could uh, replace those tabs by a comma and have a comma separated value, what's called a comma separated values file, or indeed any other separator that we wanted. So we can store data in tabular format or in some other format like the projection file in flat file. Now, flat files are great. I mean, they are. They're, they're used, as I say, widely throughout all systems for configuration files and things like that. They're all tech, raw text files. You can go in, you can edit them, you can update them in a standard text editor. They're readable into multiple different types of software, certainly things when it's in a sort of standardized format, like a CSV. You can write, write, load a CSV into ArcGIS. You can load it into the R statistics program, you can load it into Excel. Pretty interchangeable. But there are some problems with using flat files as a basis of a database system. And uh, primarily, that's the, they're very inefficient. And they're inefficient because quite often you end up duplicating information across multiple files. So I've got a copy of a table. My colleague in my regional office wants a copy of it wants that data, I have to copy the file on my computer, send it to them, and then they've got Now we've got two copies of the same file. So maybe I find a problem in mine, I edit mine and change it. Now we've got two versions that don't quite match up. And perhaps some third person is trying to understand what the two I've, I've done and my colleague have done, and we've done slight, and they're looking at it and they're saying, well, this doesn't work with this data because they've got an updated version. So you end up with duplications of data, and duplications, when you've got duplicates, they get out of phase because they're separate and they're not connected. So if we can avoid duplicating data or information, then we can, reduce, we can increase our efficiency of data usage. They're pretty large files, or can be. I mean, a small text file is nothing. But once you're getting a million, hundred million records in a text file, you're talking about gigabytes of data. So everything slows up, it takes time to process large files. The larger the files, 
the slower they are to process. So they can be quite inefficient like that. Only one user can edit a text file at any one time. It gets locked out by the computer. So if I'm editing a, a file on a shared server, it's locked out to me. Nobody else can edit that file while I'm editing that file. So you can read it. You might be able to read it. The other person might be able to read it, but not read right to it, not write to it. So single user locks are a problem. Because text files are so flexible, what happens is you end up with different people in different places coming up with different ad hoc solutions. There is no one way, of, there's no one single way of doing things. People can do things in any way you like. That projection file, I could use the Esri format for that projection file, or the same information I could reformat in my own style and use that. So unless we all use the same way of formatting and arranging the data in a text file, we've got problems. We've got these, all these individual ad hoc solutions that don't talk to each other because we've, used, we've done things in different ways. Because everybody's done things in different ways and applications are built on top of ad hoc solutions, they tend to be, the applications and the data tend to be quite closely linked. Yep, because you've written an application that reads a particular format of file. So application and, di and data are closely linked. So it's not easy, for example, to plug in perhaps a new application onto the, your data set, uh, on top of your data set, accessing the data set. And because of all that, as a consequence, there's increased time to both manage the data and develop the system in flat file. So, flat files, great, but not a solution to databasing, serious databasing problems. So what does a DBMS, or a database management system, give us? Well, it helps us avoid data duplication, or as it's called, data redundancy. So all our, we've got a single, all our data is in one place, hopefully we shouldn't need to make copies. Of course, the reality is people do make copies or whatever, but then you're, you're managing one data set that is your responsibility. You can say to the other people, this is our data set, this is our standard. Any copies, any derivations from this data set are no longer our responsibility, so to speak. The applications are separated from data. You're managing your data within your database, but you can, you, so you can get build applications, multiple applications that you can plug into the same database. Much more efficient development. Your applications are separated from your data. You can change perhaps the database struct, the data, the underlying database, and then use the same applications onto a different database. Say so maybe you go from Postgres to MySQL or something like that. Different flavors of the same kind of underlying database. Or Conversely, you might have the same database, but then bring in, use a different set of software to, say, visualize or query the data within that database. Support multiple concurrent applications. So you can have, as I say, multiple applications onto the same data set. Improved sharing, the support for multi-user access, for updating so users can uh, multiple users can update the same data in, the, in a database at the same time. There may be issues of reconciling those updates, but that's what the database, to a certain extent, can handle. It's, uh, it can either automatically or it can pass off the, on the information to the data administrator to decide if two people have changed the same data item within a uh, item of data within a short period of time, perhaps it flags that up as a potential conflict that needs to be checked, which one of these values is correct. Because data is stored in a, struct, in a, in, in a database structure that you've defined, uh, it means you can enforce standards onto the system. So you can make certain fields, for example, and I'm using these words, fields, and things like that, and we're going to go into more detail about exactly what a field is or a column is in, in future lectures. But basically, you can enforce standards so you can say, you can't enter a, a record into this database without 
the first name and the surname and the telephone number. You've filled in enough forms in, online, I'm sure, to see the required fields and things like that. So you can import the standards on the, on the data quality standards easier. It's not that you can't enforce standards and th these things in text files. It's just a lot more of a hassle. Uh, enforce security, so they have um, users. You can set up different users with different sets of permissions, uh, and you can have a lot of control over user access uh, very easily. And therefore, the, the end result is that you reduce development and maintenance costs, in theory. But where there are benefits, there are always costs. And, uh, well, the disadvantages of implementing a database management system, there might be an initial high investment in uh, developing skills, which takes time and costs money. You may need to buy software, although, of course, increasingly there's free software available. So you might have an high, initial high investment, but then you get uh, a better, more efficient system in the long term. So can you bear that high investment period. How long can you put up with a system, the, de the development time for the system? It can be quite a complex business to structure large data sets. So there's the cost in deciding how to structure your data. And you may find once you've structured it in a way that you think's good, once you start getting your users in, actually doing things with it, you might find that, that actually wasn't the best way to structure it in the first place. So you might have to restructure. So it can be a quite a complicated, long-winded long process to decide the best structuring of the data. And the best structuring for the data may vary depending on usage. So for example, if I'm Amazon and I've got a transaction-based database which is recording everybody's purchases online and stuff like that, there may be an optimal efficient database structure from, for that, for the the sort of consumer interface, so to speak, the sales interface. But then the Amazon, the people who work for Amazon and in their sort of analytics department who are interested in trends in purchasing and stuff like that, who want to do data mining on that, that those sales database, may need a different, this data to be structured in a different way. They may have a, a, a to, to provide efficient methods for them to be able to access the, the data for this sort of date pattern discovery. Performance. Large, complex databases can be slow to retrieve data. So bear that in mind. The bigger the databases get, the slower queries are, and eventually you start hitting performance problems. I believe for things like Amazon and things like that, if you don't get a risk for, for, for websites in general, if you don't get a response from a URL, um, no, which is a web address, in a I think it's something like half a second you lose half your users or something like that. The drop-off can be huge, simply from performance-based issues. People have very short attention spans, or well, or maybe not attention spans, but patience when it comes to uh, web-based applications. They expect them to be fast and, and to work quickly. Um, also, databases are complex, obviously, pieces of software. Um, and linking other software to a database requires the various hooks in, or drivers, as they tend to be called, for accessing, for, 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 for linking the, the software, your application software, to your database. And sometimes that can be a problem, which you never get with text files, because it's easy to write a text, uh, any kind of program to write a text read a text file is very simple, but if you don't have the right drivers to connect the, your application software to your database, that can cause problems. And drivers, connecting database drivers to software, it's not just does it work or does it not work, it's how efficient it works, does it do all the functions, that you does your driver do all the functions that you wish it to. So there can be issues of connecting things together. All right, so databases. This is digital databases, obviously. First started in the 1960s on mainframe computers, uh, pretty much. That was your first serious databases in the 1960s. And we're now in the 
2000s. And this slide just sort of is a rough historical, rough sequence of how the different database models were developed. So in the 1960s, we had hierarchical and network-based da databases. Well, the next slide will about hierarchical. We'll show you what a hierarchical and a network database are running on large mainframe computers, the sort of computers that would fill whole basements and probably has less processing power than a desktop calculator nowadays. You know, these are pretty large websites. In the 70s, we started, the, the relational model came in, uh, which I imagine most of you have heard of. Anybody not heard of the relational database model? No. Okay, which is based on tables, that, uh, and that's the, what the, the database model that we're going to be dealing with mostly throughout this course. In the 1980s, in particular, limitations on the relational model were starting to be recognized, and there started to be a move towards increasing what we call semantic, the semantics in the um, databases. Uh, semantics is one of these difficult, slippery words, but basically I think of it as, as meaning, meaning. The semantics is adding meaning into your data, which is not, well, hopefully get our heads around that in due course. And that resulted in the development of the object-oriented model, which you may have heard and we'll do in the course, and also extensions of the relational model to incorporate object-like behavior. And these databases tend to be called things like object relational databases. And the PostGIS extension for spatial data in Postgres is an example of an object, sort of an example of an object relational database. The spatial side, you're dealing with spatial objects but stored in a relational database structure. Then as we move into the 2000s, uh, the millennial, millennium and beyond, we've got the rise of what have been called NoSQL, standing for NoSQL or non-SQL databases. So this is really the, the, the world of big data and complexity of data is stretching the relational model to its, um, it's stretching it. And we need new systems. We need new systems to deal with it, particularly very large data volumes. So example, I think it's called, I, I'm not an expert on NoSQL, but for example, I think the, these are the databases that underlie things like the Google search engine, PageRank engine. They are increasingly used by, I think, companies like Amazon and things like that. Uh, these are large data systems for storing large either large amounts of data or less structured data. But this is what the, this is just kind of showing you now we're gonna have sort of one slide on each of these as we go through. Oh, yes, okay. So the 21st century challenges that we're facing, so with these, why these no SQL databases are coming into the fore or starting to certainly become significant, is we've got the problem. We've got the very big data problem, terabytes, petabytes, beyond of data, whereby standard relational technologies really start to struggle when you get into very large uh, data, data volumes. And it's not just that there's large data volumes, but the structures in the data, the data structures, the relationships between the data, data are very complex, can be really quite complicated. Everything's connected, all the bits, they're all connected to each other in various ways, the bits, items of data. The data is often heterogeneous, so you've got, we're no longer talking about just numbers and classes, so we're not just talking land classification classes and uh, numeric values, uh, say things like temperature, simple temperature measurements. We're talking about photographs, multimedia, video, sound, uh, computer code, simulation model results. We're talking about a whole new complexity of data objects with their own data formats, their own structures. Increasing interest and need to access what this unstructured, semi-structured data that's stored in uh, text archives. 
particularly, I mean, from a scientific perspective, the entire history of the scientific literature, basically, is an unstructured. Every paper that's written and published in a journal is unstructured, semi or at least or minorly semi-structured. Uh, so increasingly, we want to mine the information in these semi-structured data items as well as the more highly structured data items. We've got this huge plethora of programming languages, hundreds of different types of programming languages, different data formats, different database systems, different application systems that sit on, all written in different languages. So we've got the problem of connecting, of translating between languages. Uh, oh. We've got data coming up to our up to our ears in certain areas: remote sensing, bioinformatics, the sensor traffic data. The amount of data out there is huge in certain areas, and it's distributed across. It's quite often distributed across many suppliers who might supply it in different ways, have different protocols for collecting data and stuff like that. So if you went to, um, I was looking briefly at the London Mayor's Office data warehouse uh, or for, for London, where they collate various data sets collected by the London Mayor's Office and also charities and things like this, collected by different organisations for different purposes. And we've got a problem in bringing those data together and integrating those data from many suppliers. Um, so that's bringing lots of heterogeneous data sets together. We also have the issue of bringing lots of individual similar data sets together in an aggregated format. So as I've said, I'm interested in biodiversity applications. All the museums in the world have their database of, rec of specimens in the museums, stored in the museums. But if I want, say, a map of one species for all the stuff in the museums in Europe, I would have to go to every single museum in Europe and query their databases. So increasingly, we'd need, we need systems that allow us to aggregate data from lots of individual suppliers in one place. And there's a system called GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Info Information Facility, that does that. It's one place where you go to. It's a clearinghouse for all the museums in the world that uh, sign up to the system, basically. We've got many users and many uses of the data. So increasingly in this world of citizen, data, citizen activism, we've got citizens, um, what, non-professionals, let us say. Um, I'm not saying that in a, in a, in a derogatory way, any at, in any way at all, but there are people who work with data and databases and database systems as application experts, be they environmental scientists, uh, town planners. That's the traditional users of data, but increasingly now data is being made available uh, under law and various other things. We've got lots of citizens who are interested in data. We've got skilled children interested in using the data as well and things like that. So we've got lots of different users who have lots of different uses and we have to make that data, try and make that data accessible to those, that range of users and for different uses. And of course, we live in a sort of uh, world where certain things, where we, it's difficult to imagine how to live without computers. I'm just about old enough. But when I, in fact, in my office, if you come into my office, I have my ZX81. Anybody remember a ZX81? Oh, yeah. yeah. I found it, it was found in my mother's cellar the uh, last year, uh, which I had when I was sort of 17, 18. And that, you know, I, I don't know, I hate to think how many calculations that does a second, but it's one of the, it was sort of the first, almost the, one of the first home computers that there was. Uh, Anyway, I don't know why I digressed on that, but anyway, robust systems for critical services. So we now, if the computer systems go down, if we had some massive solar flare that tripped out most of the computer systems in the country, the traffic lights would go off, the trains would stop working, the phones would stop working, everybody would start panicking, probably. And the mission and the critical services, things like Amazon, you know, if Amazon goes down for an hour, how many millions of pounds do they, of income do they lose? 
if the national health system computers go down, how many people are going to die? So there are mission critical systems, so we need really robust systems. Yeah? It's just whatever happens in my... I, I honestly think the, no, the health service is far more important than Amazon. Yeah. But it's just whatever pops into my mind as I... I, I but you will find my lectures are somewhat free form, so they, 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 <laughs> I will ramble and then I will sometimes return. To, you know. Okay, so let's just quickly uh, finally go through all these different. So in the 1960s, the first databases were hierarchical. What did it mean? Hierarchical systems. Basically, you have one root record at the top. This is just an, a sort of pseudo example of how a GIS system might work. We've got a map level. And that's where we start off. So every query starts at the map. And then perhaps we've got three counties, county A, B, C, Berkshire, Surrey, East Sussex. And then we've got to rate a date records for each of the roads in each county. Very simple. You come in at the map. You want the, the, the county C roads. You follow the node to county C. And you can get all the roads in Sussex. Very straightforward. And it was very good. It provided rapid access and updating of records. Uh, but the removing of records would require an entire restructuring of the data of the, or, or, a, or a restructuring of the tree, the hierarchical structure itself. So for example, let's say County B was dissolved under a local government reorganization happens every day, or every few years anyway, the record for C, road four, would then need to be allocated to whatever new county it would be uh, part of. So it would mean, perhaps need to join with C if B had been amalgamated into C, which means this record has to be changed, added to C, and that changes the whole tree structure of the database. So. That made it quite complicated to update these records or to change the uh, tree-like structure of the, um, or yes, as I say, removing, restructuring how the data connected to each other resulted in restructuring the tree, which means all the queries that you wrote onto it would have to be rewritten, or some of them would, might have to be rewritten. I'm not. Despite working on evolutionary data, which uses trees a lot, I um, the databases, the modern databases are open to, able to cope with this deleting and adding of records. The modern tree base databases. However, in the 1960s, this was a real problem. Also, there's a problem that each, or a very big problem that each node has only one parent. So row two can only be under county A. But what if road two was the M1? The M1 covers, goes from, through most of England, or a lot of England, covers a lot of counties. What would we do? We'd end up either associating it with only one county, not good, having multiple versions of M1 under each county, duplication, or something like that. We, we've got to do either one of those to, to, to deal with the problems. So we've got duplication, we've got problems with the uh, relationship between roads and counties, fitting that into our hierarchical system. So to deal with that, they added, basically extended the hierarchical system to include multiple parents to create a network database. So in the network database, each node can now have multiple parents, so we can have this thing about a road being associated with multiple counties. But again, we still have this problem of adding and removing records, because we've still got the a, a, a hierarchy is simply a special type of network. Uh, we've still got this problem that every time we remove a node, the whole structure of our network changes, and that has knock-on effects. And also in the 1960s, where processing power was very limited, it was really difficult to model large amounts of connections on nodes. So you were hitting processing power problems. So the 1970s, 
Along came Edgar F. Codd at IBM. Uh, and he came up with a relational database model, which is now the most widely used database model in the world, by far. I don't know what proportion of databases are relational databases, but probably 70% plus, I suspect, of serious databases. Um, the relational model, in the relational model, data is stored as records in a table. And confusingly, tables are called relations in the relation. So the relational model came out of computer science and of, out of log, uh, logic and out of... Um, oh, what's the other? There's a... So it's come out of the sort of mathematics, computer science background and therefore they use the terminology that came from the computer science background uh, and the matrix manipulation back, maths background. So tables tend to be called relations and that's why it's a relational database. I always thought when I first started that the relations were the connections between the data, that's what you'd expect, but a relation is actually a table in relational terminology. You just gotta live with these things. The data in the relational model is, is stored in separate tables which are brought together by joining, joining those tables using key attributes and relational logic. So here's a table, just a quick anatomy of a table, and we'll be doing the lots more on this relational model next week. But we're well aware, hopefully aware of a table. We've got uh, a table in which each column or property, or field, or attribute, these are all synonyms for the same thing, column, stores equivalent values for a record, and each row contains a record. So here we've got a database of something, it's called group, deep, group table, the table's called group. So these are postcodes, these are postcode sectors. We've got the number of households in each postcode sector, the, members of the, the number of households which are the members of group one, group two, whatever they are. I think they're demographic classifications, but we won't worry about that. So records for an individual instance are in the rows and similar values, equivalent values in the columns. And just to make life hard, in database terminology, relational database terminology, a record or a row is called a tuple a tuple, just to make things handy. So tuples equals row or record. Technically, there's a slight difference between a row and a tuple, but we won't get into that right now. So when we want to connect data in different tables, we do something like a join. Okay, so here we've got a table with counties and the population, and we've got another table with the roads in each county. We want to know uh, how many roads are in each county and what the density of roads for, each pop for the population is. So we can do something, we know the county, we've got the county in the, pop in the population table, we've got the county in the road table, we match the values in each one through a join, and lots more on this in due course, and that allows us to get an output table that gives us the count, that gives us uh, for each county We've got the population from the population table, and we've done a summarize. Uh, we've joined that information, the road data, onto the county data, and we've done a summary of the road data in each county. So we've got a count of the number of roads, three roads in county A, one in county D, and then we've also uh, calculated the uh, roads per 1,000 population. So that's basically the relational model, as I say. We've got a whole... Next week is totally on the relational model. In fact, we'll be on the relational model for about a long while. So currently, the most commonly used model, it's a simple standardised data model. So everything is in tables in the, relational, in the relational model. There is no other. You don't think about networks. You think about tables. You can make networks out of tables, but that's a different matter. All the data is basically stored in a table. Lots, it's strong community implementation standards through structured query language. So if I use out my SQL, I can write SQL, sorry, SQL in the database system called MySQL, which is an implementation of the relational model. Then I move on to Postgres, 
it's almost the same language in the two. There's always slight differences, but there's a lot of similarities. So I can take what I know from one database system and then I work in another database system very straightforwardly. And there are lots of software, different software implementations, relational database management systems, Oracle, Microsoft Access, MySQL, PostgreSQL, hundreds of relational model implementations of the relational model. But remember, not all data is optimally tabular. Images, spatial data, text, um, unstructured text, images, sound, video, hierarchies, networks, don't fit well in the relational model. If all you've got is a land use class and a number, that works very well. But if you've got these more complicated data objects, they don't slot into a nice tab tabular format. You can put a whole image or a whole spatial object in a, f in a column, and that's how you create object relational databases by doing that, but you can't, sim that's a more complicated thing. You then need special things that allow you to read what data you've inserted into a field. Anyway, we'll get into that. And to, for complicated, the more complicated the data becomes, the more and more complicated it becomes to break down that data into a set of ta related tables. And that's kind of similar to the, it's got connections, this is sort of why this is a problem. So for example, for networks, you've got nodes, you've got links, you've got attributes between them, and you have to squeeze those into a table. So it's, not, it's a complicated and unintuitive sometimes process to take uh, something like a network or an image or a video and try and stick it into some kind of tabular structure. It doesn't work. You can do it, but it doesn't. it's not very sensible. It's a, round, it's a square peg in a round hole. And as these systems become more and more complex to deliver, to, to, to build, the structure of your relational database becomes more and more complex. It becomes more and more difficult to users to understand it. And the more and more, and slower and slower, the performance gets lower and lower because every time you do a query, it has to run through a very complex system before it gets its results. And it slows development up as well. So there's a trade-off between simplicity and complexity in, in database design. 1980s. So this complexity problem was one of the major drivers behind object databases. Um, and an object, orient, object database or an object-oriented database attempts to model the world as intuitive object classes. And we're going to have a whole lecture, a whole week on object model later in the uh, system. And in the object model, we're throwing away the tables. We throw away the tables and uh, we store, you, you develop objects and these objects, these date digital objects have attributes like a relational table, so effectively fields, but those attributes could be in fact complex data objects as well. So they, so they can be quite complicated, those attributes, but more importantly, you also have store in the object behavior. So you not only store what the object, how the, the description of the object, but you also describe, include code that tells, that defines what you can do to that object. Update it, relate it to another object or something like that. This will all come clear in, future, in a future lecture. So your behavior might return data, calculate statistics, search text, something like that. But every object, you can only ever do to an object what is defined as part of its behavior. Okay, so they're kind of locked up. And they also store more important rela uh, relationships between objects, such as part of and type of relationships, which relational models don't store very well. So I've got a little graphic. Because I remember when I did my master's in GIS, and, I, in the, and that was in the mid-80s? Mid yeah, it must have been. No, mid, early 90s. I must admit, I was totally flummoxed by the object model. 
Because in those days, you couldn't, it wasn't a simple thing to, in fact, it still isn't easy to get. I still can't find a simple object re relational, an object database that we could run for a little test scenario. They're still quite complicated big bits of software. Anyway, I've got this little kind of analogy, metaphor, so hopefully at this, a simple way of, so you can get a grit of the difference between the relational model and the object model. So cats. Cats, each cat is unique. Every object that we model in the world is unique. People are unique, computers are unique, whatever, everything's unique. So objects have unique identifiers. They have attributes. So a cat has a name, has a color, perhaps. It probably has other things as well. It's, got a, it's made up of parts. This cat has an ear, which is part of its head. That's useful. And the head is part of the cat. So this is this part of relationships that objects can store. And color is an attribute not only of the whole cat, potentially, but of its individual body parts as well. So overall, it might be a tortoise shell, but it's got a white leg. Do we care? Well, maybe we do if we're part of the uh, whoever runs the, the cat shows or whatever. So how does a cat, uh, typical my, another song. So how does a cat, and this is an attempt, my attempt to show what a cat, the difference between a complicated cat in a relational model and a cat in an object model might look like or feel like. So a relational cat, in my relational cat, I've got one table for each element of the cat, each component of the cat. So one for its cranium, its head, one for its nose, its mouth, its eye, its ears, and its whiskers, etc. So I've got one table for each part of its body that I want to describe. And I need to, so I want information on the cat's head. Well, I need to know what bits I have to connect together to make up the cat's head. And I need to know. Here's my query, select star, star just means all. You know, this is a pseudo example. Select all as head, because I want to call it the head, from the cranium table, the nose table, the mouth table, the eye table, the ears table, the whiskers table. Now, to do that, I need to know all the tables that make up the cat's head. That is not data stored in the relational model at the moment. I, there is nothing that... There is no definition of he cat head in, the in this relational model. There's all the bits, and then you have to select which bits you want and put them back together again. In, a, in our object cat, the hierarchy of parts is inherent in the object model that's been written. So in this case, this circle's meant to be over the cat's head. Because the model includes the definition that a head is made up of a cranium, a nose, a mouth, etc., etc., all I have to do is do cat's, sort of re to return the cat head, I just do cat.head. So I, it knows that it, what the head is in relation to the cat. This, as you hopefully can see, is a far more intuitive way of accessing the information on a cat head than that. Okay, this is an analogy metaphor. It's just a simple way. We'll get, later on, we'll get to graph. You'll get to see that. Right. No SQL. OK, so we're in the 2000s now, the millennium. We're in the millennial world. We've got increases, as I've said, in data volume, data complexity. So to, to deal with these challenges, a whole new suite of database systems and designs have, be, have, come, have been developed. Half of these are simply adaptations and updates of the old network and hierarchical systems in the modern world. We now have the processing power to deal with multi hundreds and hundreds of edges linking on a node. We now have the processing power to do that. So some of these are just new versions of old things that have been around for 30 years, and some are new, new things. And NoSQL, it's just... There are lots of different types of them doing different things. And basically, these are the new things that are not SQL relational databases. That's all no SQL means. It's not a thing in itself. It's defining that it isn't a relational model. And these, depending on your needs, you might choose a different one of these models. 
So, for example, if Amazon, I can read that you might probably can't read this slide, uses a key value store, don't worry, we don't need to worry about what a key value store is, but Amazon, the dynamic uh, database developed by Amazon, is a key value pair system. There's also one called Voldemort, which underlines LinkedIn, the LinkedIn social network. Uh, then we've got uh, versions of what's called Big Table, which is underlies Google, the Google search engines and things like that. And they are concentrating, as you can see, on speed and scalability with large data volumes rather than complexity. Other systems are not so good on large data volumes, but are good on more complicated data relationships. So you've got document databases, CouchDB, MongoDB, specifically designed these ones to store things like um, uh, structured, semi-structured text documents and things like this. This is the sort of thing you might store a scientific paper in or something like that. And then there's graph data, in a new, whole new world of graph databases which are really taking off now and becoming really quite important, I think. I think they're, they're, they're probably the most interesting area of database development in, uh, at the moment. Well, maybe it's just my personal interest in networks and graphs and things like that. So, for example, uh, the Neo4j system, I know colleagues of mine are using the Neo4j to build the tree of life, the evolutionary relationships between all organisms on the parts. If you maybe saw this week, there were, they had a press announcement, they'd released the biggest uh, reconstruction of the evolutionary history of life on Earth. It was done with Neo4j. Uh, so. So very large, very large, big processing systems that require com complex data systems, uh, or very involved complex data, related data. Space. Oh, right. Where does space come into all this? Well, I have briefly mentioned space. So spatial data. The great problem with spatial data is that it's related to each other in space. That's its problem either in two dimensions or three dimensions, or possibly, if we include time, four dimensions. And the spatial data, because of the way those, the, the, the dimensions, the spatial data dimensions are related, we can't store them in tables. It's very efficient to store all spatial data in a tabular format. So, standard relational indexes do not operate on spatial data because you have to operate in two or three dimensions as opposed to just one text or numeric dimension. Um, you need to return not numbers or tables, you need to return geometric objects as well. So uh, you, you can't return a map as a table, really. I mean, you could have a table of x, y coordinates, but that's not a map, that's a table. You can't return a graphic, which we need. So in the beginning, as I mentioned, I think earlier, DIS came out of a box. It was a standalone system. So when I started at the water board, we had Small World, which is a sort of object or relational database used to store uh, particularly utility networks. And it was totally separate from the, uh, corp the rest of the corporate database system. We'd store the geometry, the index, and any non-spatial attributes in the GIS database, separate GIS database. And then we would have a GIS data engine, as it's called here, that talked to the database, the underlying database, and did things like the analysis, ran the analysis, and stuff like that. So if I did, wanted to do a network trace to find which households were going to have their water supply cut off, when this water main burst, then I would the, the, the net water network model would be in the database, and then the GIS engine would actually undertake the calculations to uh, find out which households were going to lose their water. And uh, the tools is the interface that sits on top of that. And basically, you get the whole lot out of a box, and you use it as an isolated system. Well, that's not very handy when you're in a corporate environment. Uh, so people wanted to integrate their 
relation, the data stored in their relational databases, their sort of normal data in relational databases with the uh, GIS data, quite understandably. So rather than copying, so in originally, in the first generation, you had to make a copy from the relational database into your spatial database. Increasingly, say in the 1980s, oh, I've got a crossing over the slides again here. They started to link in for the attributes, the non-spatial data stored in the external relational databases started to plug in to the GIS engine. So we could now store the non-spatial data in the relational database and the spatial data in the spatial database, but we could actually bring the two together. But we still didn't have one database with all our data in, which would be preferable. Uh, sorry about the loss of those. Um, and that works quite well, a sort of loose coupling, but it's still not an integrated solution. You want one database to manage, not two, if you can possibly help it. So the drive was, uh, there has then been, and is pretty much completed now, I must say, to, to integrate spatial technology into the relational database system. So we're now in the situation where the geometry is now stored in a standard relational database, but we have spatial objects and spatial queries. We've, got, we've extended the relational model using object types of approaches uh, to extend the, the relational model so that we now have effectively thrown away the original space, special spatial database, and we're now using a standard relational database with these extra add-ins to allow us to manage the spatial data. And that's what the uh, PostGIS extension to Postgres is. So we now have one integrated database, and we can access through SQL. This would be the PostGIS section. That's the Postgres section. And the GIS tools can now use standard SQL or extended SQL to access both the attribute data and the spatial data in a single database solution. So we've come up, we've ended up with a much more efficient um, sort of arrangement architecture of parts. And pretty much the main relational databases now, most re big or mainstream relational databases now support, pretty much support full spatial integration. So this is now the norm. Okay, a lot of companies are still in the old situation where they've got different data like this, maybe for different reasons, for, maybe for organizational reasons. But increasingly, this is the model that's being adopted. And this is the model that we're going to, I'm going to teach you, or I'm going to implement a bit. Separation of applications from data, we'll ignore that. I just think. Uh, and we can ignore that as well. But, but what all I'm saying, all this slide is kind of showing is that now you now build things together. We're in the situation where instead of getting this box that says GIS, installing it and away you go, we're much more in a world where a plug a, a, a component-based software where you choose the bits of software to do particular tasks and you link them together to create a working application rather than just taking something out of the box, ArcGIS, and using ArcGIS. So for example, these are different alternatives. So I could have a database in MySQL. So I might have all my data in MySQL. I maybe, this is for sort of web-based applications. I maybe have a map interface written in the software like Mapnik. You may have, it's just a mapping software. And I might do my spatial analysis in a, a library, uh, a, a Java library or something like Shapely. So my data, my spatial data is being stored in my database. I'm doing my analysis in my web browser using, a job, using two JavaScript libraries, one for doing the mapping and one for doing the spatial analysis. Alternatively, that same MySQL database, I could plug in the QGIS, uh, anyone familiar with QGIS? Anyone not familiar with QGIS? Yeah, QGIS is a, the biggest, I would say, open source uh, GIS package. Uh, it's closely linked, it's got good links to uh, these spatial relational databases. So I could do both my mapping and my analysis in QGIS, but store my data in MySQL. 
I could alternatively store my data in a, in a in an object relational database, PostGIS, PostgreSQL, it could be MySQL, and do the analysis in there. And then just do the mapping using a JavaScript library like Leaflet. So this, these two options do exactly the same thing. They both do mapping, analysis, and data. But in this case, we've, we're doing the analysis and the mapping in JavaScript here, and the data in the database here, we're just doing the mapping in JavaScript and we're doing the actual analysis as well as the database storage in our relational database. And then finally, the all-in packages still exist like ArcGIS. So we can come up with these various architectures depending on what our user needs are, what our company requirements are. All right, I think that's taken long with you. So, okay, summary. There are all these alternative database models out there. There's been a trend from the 1960s to the present day of more complicated, complex models, more semantics, bigger data, integrating different types of data. But there are real trade-offs in speed and usability about these. It's not just, more is not always better. Sometimes sleek and lean is better than uh, all singing, all dancing. The database developer, and this is basically what you're, you're going to be a database developer and an applications developer in this module. Your job is to select the most appropriate set of tools for the task in hand. But there may be external things that limit what you can do, resources, time, corporate policies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's not a unless it's not always a free reign, and you may not be used to it may not be possible for you to use what you think are the most appropriate tools for a task because of external limitations. Um, probably the most important thing about databases overall is that they separate the data from the application, which means it's, it's, it becomes easier to, base these, to build these component-based solutions rather than getting the big ArcGIS out the box uh, and having a single solution like that. And it requires a spatial model, data data requires spatial model. And now mo many DBMSs, including the NoSQLs now, starting to have spatial support as well. It's just starting to be implemented in these NoSQL models. So they're a bit behind. 